Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our last part of the lecture on the Mohr stress diagram. And in this section, I want to talk about two important aspects that uh, can be evaluated using the Mohr stress diagram. That's the reactivation of falls. That means uh, existing fractures that can slide again if the stress conditions are right and the influence of fluid pressure which uh, as you will see has a profound impact on the stability of rocks. Let's start with the reactivation of pre-existing fractures which follows the law of sliding friction or Bialy's law. Bialy's law allows us to estimate uh, critical shear stresses for fault activation. It uh, helps us to find out about the potential uh, whether existing fractures might slide in a given stress field and uh, we can evaluate the potential of fractures that we know about perhaps in mining, in open cast or in deep mining, uh, whether pre-existing fractures are likely or not likely to slip in the given regional stress field that a mining engineer will know about. Here we see a more stress diagram that uh, shows the uh, envelope of sliding friction. Uh, we see here it starts at the origin at about uh, 200 megapascals. We see here a kink from a slope angle of about 40 degrees to a slope angle of about uh, 31 degrees. Uh, these lines are determined by experiments by frictional sliding experiments and uh, each of these dots that we see on this diagram represents uh, one such experiment carried out at different shear and normal stresses acting on uh, fracture surfaces. Uh, so this is uh, one of the original diagrams uh, that uh, were uh, used to support Bialy's law. The expression of Bialy's law is uh, very similar to uh, that of Coulomb's law of failure. We see here there is uh, the critical shear stress that equals the tangent of uh, phi f times the normal stress and uh, 10f would be uh, the coefficient of sliding friction uh, whereas uh, phi f is uh, simply the angle of sliding friction. For all uh, stresses not exceeding about 200 megapascals, the most appropriate angle of sliding friction is 40 degrees. Thereafter, at higher stresses, 31 degrees is the slope angle of uh, Bialy's law or the envelope of sliding friction uh, that we see here. We superimpose here now Coulomb's law of failure, the Coulomb failure envelope, uh, you will see, is more or less parallel to uh, the envelope of sliding friction at higher stresses. And we see here normal stresses are given in kilobars. Uh, megapascals uh, would uh, simply uh, be the same numbers times 100. So two kilobars normal stress correspond to 200 megapascals uh, using the uh, uh, more modern uh, unit for stress. Now we also see here the similarity of uh, Coulomb's law of failure. Uh, it is almost identical. The critical shear stress is also here the tangent of the internal angle of friction times normal stress. Uh, the difference is that for Coulomb's law of failure we need to add the cohesive strength. For the reactivation of fractures, uh, in, according to Bialy's law, we don't have to do that because the fracture already has formed. Cohesion already has been lost. And that makes the important difference here at the left-hand side of the more stress diagram. We see that Coulomb's law of failure does not start at the origin it starts elevated at the given cohesive strength, uh, which uh, is anything between uh, typically 20 or 40 uh, megapascals. The area that is important for geologists is anyway the relatively low stress area. The brittle part of the crust uh, 
will not go deeper than perhaps 300 or 400 megapascals. Thereafter, we can expect, due to the uh, geothermal gradient in uh, the Earth's crust, uh, that we are in the ductile field anyway, with low shear strength and without any fracturing occurring, or at least uh, fracturing will be much less important than a ductile flow. Uh, at stresses of uh, 600, 700, 800 megapascals uh, deep in the Earth's crust. That means for rock mechanics, uh, this is the interesting area. And this is also where we see here, right on the left hand side, uh, the large difference between Coulomb's law of failure and uh, Bayerly's law of sliding friction. Here now we see a uh, more stress diagram plotted for this uh, shallow crustal environment uh, with our parabolic failure envelope for transitional tensile failure. We see Coulomb's law of failure and we see here from the origin and a slope angle of uh, 40 degrees uh, the uh, envelope of sliding friction according to Bayerly's law. Uh, what we also see here is a more circle plotted into this diagram with uh, sigma 1 of 100 megapascals and a sigma 3 of 15 megapascals. This stress condition is uh, stable in an unfractured rock. We see the more circle is uh, still away from uh, Coulomb's failure envelope here. There is still a gap. Uh, if the rock is unfractured, this would be a stable stress conditions. No deformation would take place. However, what we see is that the Mohr circle overlaps with Bayerly's law with the envelope of sliding friction. There are here uh, four points that define this overlap here and here and also on the conjugated side here and here. In between we have these shaded regions and these shaded regions uh, represent the areas in which fractures can be reactivated. And we can express that as two theta angles. We see here any fault with an orientation of two theta larger than 20 and smaller than 78 degrees is likely to slide under these stress conditions of 15 and 100 megapascals. The same happens uh, for the corresponding conjugated fractures that we see uh, down here. Also here we see the same overlap of the Mohr circle with the criterion defined by Bayerly's law. When we look at a rock sample, for instance in a uh, friction sliding test, we would find uh, that uh, all pre-existing fractures in the shaded areas here uh, they would likely slide under the given stress conditions. That means, in principle, uh, the envelope of sliding friction works in exactly the same way like uh, our other failure envelopes. They only consider a situation where there is no cohesion in the rock along pre-existing fractures. Uh, this is why the envelope of sliding friction originates here at the origin of the Mohr stress diagram, not at elevated position of cohesive strength like Coulomb's law of failure. For Coulomb failure, we first have to overcome the cohesive strength of a rock before we can fracture it. Let's make uh, some experiments. Let's assume an unfractured rock uh, attains uh, stress conditions that are sufficiently large to cause failure. For instance, uh, these conditions here. Uh, we see now here sigma 1 is 114 megapascals, uh, sigma 3 is 15 megapascals uh, in a rock defined by the Coulomb envelope and the corresponding uh, parabolic envelope. Uh, the, such a rock would fail and it would produce fractures at a 2 theta angle of 60 degrees. We see uh, also here conjugated fractures would form and uh, this is illustrated here by these fractures that we see here with opposite shear senses. These are the fractures that form under these critical stress conditions. 
once you form these fractures, stress will be released. And uh, stress release is expressed in the more stress diagram by smaller, more circles. We would drop to a smaller differential stress illustrated by this orange a more circle and uh, we will not be able to increase the differential stresses to higher values because as soon as the more circle will touch the envelope of sliding friction where our now existing fractures are uh, present displacement by sliding along the fracture would take place that means uh, before we had fractures, we could increase the differential stress to conditions that then would cause Coulomb fracturing. Once the fracture exists, we cannot increase the differential stress to any magnitude larger than what we see here because uh, this Mohr circle touches the envelope of sliding friction. And as soon as that takes place, the pre-existing fracture, the fracture that we just have formed, would slide again and release stress. That means no larger Mohr circles are possible once the rock is fractured. Let's make a second experiment uh, and uh, let's uh, consider uh, a situation in the shallower crust at lower uh, normal stresses and that means our Mohr circle will sit further to the left of the Mohr stress diagram. Also here we can uh, fracture a rock according to Coulomb failure and uh, we see here and here intersection takes place and uh, these two conjugated fractures form again at a two theta angle of 60 degrees but again once this fracture forms the stress will be released and the maximum stress that we can build in this rock now is represented by this now very small blue circle uh, because uh, our pre-existing fractures, they don't change their orientation. They are touching now here and here uh, the envelope of sliding friction. As soon as stresses would be large enough uh, that the corresponding Mohr circle reaches this size, sliding fr friction takes place along these two pre-existing fractures. I would like to remind you to a diagram that we have discussed in an earlier lecture. Here we see simply the uh, differential stress strain diagram, experimental results carried out at different confining stresses. And confining stress simply is represented by the normal stress in the Mohr stress diagram. High confining stresses are represented by Mohr circles that are further to the right hand side in the deeper crust. Uh, low confining stresses are represented by more circles that sit further to the left. Uh, this would simulate situations as they are present closer to the surface in the very shallow brittle crust. We have seen for experiments carried out at low confining pressure resembling shallow crustal environments that the uh, differential stress to fracture a rock was not as high as similar experiments carried out at high confining stress. We also have seen that the drop after fracturing at low confining pressure to sliding friction levels was uh, very significant. So the differential stress might not have been as high at uh, low confining stresses, but the drop was very significant in order to slide along the now freshly created fracture. This was different at high confining stresses. A higher differential stress was required to fracture the rock, but the drop after fracturing was less significant than the drop that we have seen before in the shallow crust. Let's look at that again because I think the connection between these diagrams is important for the understanding of these processes. Let's look again. A large Mohr circle further to the right hand side of the Mohr stress diagram representing higher confining stresses. That would correspond to perhaps experiments such as uh, these here. 
we need a higher differential stress. That means a larger Mohr circle to fracture the rock and to create new conjugated fractures. But once we have created these fractures, the drop to the sliding friction level is smaller than in experiments that are carried out at lower confining stress, representing shallower crustal environments. The differential stress that we need for fracturing is smaller, but the drop after fracturing to sliding friction level is larger. Why is that so? It is simply a geometrical relationship between Coulomb's law of failure and Bayerly's law uh, of uh, sliding friction. We see here at low normal stresses on the left hand side of the Mohr stress diagram, these two curves are far apart. The Coulomb failure envelope is uh, much higher in the diagram here than the envelope of sliding friction. And with increasing normal stress, going to the right hand side of the Mohr stress diagram, the two envelopes approach each other until they eventually intersect. This explains why the drop in differential stress from fracturing to sliding friction level is smaller at high confining stresses than at low confining stresses. If we take this a little bit further, we will see that at certain crustal depths, uh, that means at a depth beyond the intersection of Coulomb's law and the envelope of sliding friction. It doesn't really matter whether fractures are present in the crust or not. Because we see here uh, this uh, large Mohr circle, these stress conditions of uh, 120 and 500 megapascals for sigma 3 and sigma 1 respectively they are required to fracture this rock. It is not relevant whether or not fractures already exist in this rock. The reason for that is that at this depth, the cohesion is equally large than the friction that the normal stress imposes on existing fractures. We see that in this diagram here, for very high confining stresses, we reach a point where we can fracture the rock and start sliding, but the sliding friction along the fractures requires an equal differential stress uh, as the fracturing itself. Perhaps we can illustrate that with, with a simple example. Uh, let's assume you have a pile of bricks as we see it here. Uh, it might be very easy for you to uh, slide away one of these bricks here at the top. You might also be able to uh, pull out a brick that is here in the second or maybe the third layer, but you will not be able to pull out a brick from underneath here. Also, around all these bricks, there are pre-existing fractures. There are surfaces where there is no cohesion between one and another brick. You will not be able to pull out one of these bricks down here because of the overburden of bricks that lie on top of that. And what does that mean, overburden of bricks? It simply means an increase in normal stress. Bricks down here are exposed to a much higher normal stress than bricks up here. And it's the same in the Earth crust. In the Earth crust, you increase the normal stresses with increasing depth. The only difference in the Earth crust is that the normal stress would not act only vertically, it would act in all directions. That is the lithostatic stress component that is always present, irrespective of tectonic stresses that might pull the rock in this or that direction.